Well, there's a revolution going on in rec rooms, offices, and classrooms around the world. A revolution in which 15 million people are taking part. They're sharing scientific data, arguing philosophy, or passing on cooking tips and gossip, night and day through a computer network called Internet. For about $200 a year, they log on to personal computers connected to phone lines and communicate across cultures and continents. Bill Cameron has this report on the growing phenomenon of Internet. For years they've been saying these things would change the world, would mature from adding machines and typewriters to tools of the human spirit. Now, maybe it's coming true because of Internet. Internet is a growing grid of independent computer networks interlaced. It's evolved from a U.S. military bulletin board in the 1970s to a worldwide computer switchboard. In two ways, you need to go and... You need a computer and a phone, and suddenly you're part of a new mesh of people, programs, archives, ideas. Playwright and Internet enthusiast John Allen says it feels a bit like everyday human fellowship, but it's bigger and more precise. You can walk into a bar and decide that you want to have a conversation about uh, football today because we're just at a football game. And there might be two or three people who want to talk about football in the bar, but it'd be very difficult to find them. In this world, there's a table with a big sign on it saying football, and there's about 150 or a thousand jocks from all around the world who want to talk about football. So you sit down, you say, what do you think of the Raiders? <coughs> and uh, 500 people answer you. Answer you through local switchboards like CRS in Toronto. CRS started as a local message exchange. Now it's a channel to internet as well and scrambling to plug in more lines and controllers. It's tapped a yearning to connect to talk with the world about art, music, sex, guitar construction, conservative politics, grief. John Allen says it's a modulated anarchy. There's a, an interesting kind of restraint that you find. I mean, there's not a lot of cursing or swearing. There's not a lot of um, personal um, cuts. There's not a lot of um, put-downs that one would expect to find. There's not, you know, there's not screenfuls of, you know, go to hell, uh, um, which is surprising. So the kind of liberation is, is, is mixed. It's, it's interesting because one would think if you're anonymous, you'd do anything you want. But people have a, in a group have their own sense of community and what we can do. The thing that, uh, though, that I'm always left with when I leave is this overwhelming desire for people to be rooted. And the only way they feel rooted is through another person. And if this is the way that they, can, the only way maybe that they can talk to somebody, this is how they'll do it. The electronic scream means you're connected to anywhere, to anyone riding the same internet circuit from Turkey, Greenland, Peru, or Nova Scotia. So you put out a general question, and you wait. Computer communication is not much like most human communication. There's no body language, no intonation, no facial expression to help you know which way something ambiguous is meant. That's great reads the same on Internet as, oh, that's great. So the isolated communicators of cyberspace have come up with little signs made out of punctuation marks. They're called emoticons. They go at the end of sentences as graphic explanations. They come out sideways. Tilt your head left and you'll see a little smiley face that means I'm kidding. A little frowny face that means I'm serious. The homota file you put onto the internet. It's not all whimsy. Not long ago you could find an internet message that contained apparently accurate details of testimony at a manslaughter trial in Ontario. Details covered by a court order that suppressed their publication. We asked the man who sent that message about the ethics of breaking the ban. Here's his answer. The murder file's gone now, wiped somehow from the sender's computer and from the parts of the Internet I can reach. But the information is out, downloaded into any number of computers around the world, along with all the flirtations, debates, shared poetry at Midnight Contract Bridge. 
and the answers to that question we posted to the world about the meaning of the Internet. Stein in Oslo. There are no borders on the Internet. Color, age, and nationality don't matter. Andrea in Washington, D.C. It frees me to be me, not someone inconveniencing others with my needs as a deaf person. Richard, somewhere in England. I can indulge my deep and abiding passion for all things Thai. Hattie in Toronto. It has more soul than any human being I know. Mark in Pennsylvania. The net is helping the University of Asmara in Eritrea with books on everything. Gerardo in Mexico. It's a window to the world. Marcus in Milan. Internet is liberty, friends all over the world, fun, information, anonymity, part of our everyday life, and much, much more. Much, much more every day. Magazines, newspapers, television programs have started to take notice, and the coverage has led to an explosion of interest. The Internet is growing like an embryonic brain at a rate of 10% a month. It's all pure, clear, free, unregulated communication, although some of the regulators are thinking about changing that. U.S. congressional hearings into the Internet begin next month. Here in Canada, nothing yet. Borders still count for something. For CBC Primetime News, I'm Bill Cameron in Toronto.